Good evening, friends, and welcome again to the New Heart Revival Series. Coming to you here from the uh, Amazing Facts headquarters in Sacramento, California. I'd like to welcome all of those who are joining us across the country and around the world on the various social media outlets. We just got a report in that uh, last night's program was viewed more than 100,000 times. And if you put all of the programs together, there's many more that have seen these programs. And that's really the goal of this, to try and share this good news with as many people as possible. We indeed need a revival and a reformation in our lives. I'd like to thank those of you who have given us a testimony of how these meetings have been a blessing to you. We've had many people contact us, and we don't have time to mention all of them, but I'd just like to highlight one or two. And we got a message from Sue that says, Thank you for sharing these teachings. I am so happy that I found you on YouTube. So we'd like to greet all of those of you who are watching on YouTube. Uh, Cindy says, I am so grateful for these timely messages. So welcome, Cindy. Thank you for sharing that. And then we got somebody who contacted us all the way from India. And they said, Hello, I'm from India. Uh, we're going through some difficult times here, but I want to thank you for this revival series. It brings new hope and encouragement. And that's really the goal of these meetings, to share hope and encouragement. So if you've been blessed by these presentations, we'd love to hear from you. Also, if you have a Bible question, you can just, if you're on Facebook, you can type in your question. We'll try and answer as many of these questions as we work our way through the series. We do have a free offer we'd like to tell you about. It is a book talking about the Word of God. It's called The Ultimate Resource. And we'd like to send this to you for free. What you'll need to do is text the word rediscover to the number 40544 and you'll receive a digital copy of the book the ultimate resource again just text the word rediscover to 40544 i think it'll be a rich blessing for you as you read this wonderful resource talking about the bible and you'll be inspired and encouraged by that well before we get to uh, the study of god's word it's always important for us to begin with the word of prayer so let's pray Dear Father, we thank you again that we're able to open up your word and study. We are in, in need of your spirit. We are seeking revival and reformation in our hearts, in our lives, in our families. So Father, once again, we ask for you to guide us, be with us here in Sacramento and those watching across the country and around the world. And Lord, may we come to a clearer and full understanding of your grace and your power revealed in your word. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd also like to remind you, if you're viewing this in English, but you'd prefer to view the program in Spanish, we do have a live Spanish translation at the Amazing Facts Latino Facebook page. So you can go there right now, just Amazing Facts Latino. We'd also like to remind you about our free Bible school that you can enroll on. Just go to the Amazing Facts website, just amazingfacts.org, and you can enroll in the uh, Study Guide Bible School series. But at this time, I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward, and we're going to take some of your Bible questions. And Pastor Doug, we need to remember to keep our six feet distance here. Somebody did text in and tell us we weren't standing far enough away from each other. Uh, I've already got whatever he's got. <laughs> meeting, so <laughs> we, <laughs> we work together every day. <laughs> keep our distance here. But again, thank you for your questions, and uh, we're going to get right to it. Our first question is from uh, Helene, and she asks, Does forgiveness always have to end in reconciliation? Well, not necessarily. You want to forgive people even if they won't forgive you because you, you can be uh, damaged. You're hurt by your own bitterness by not forgiving them. And uh, someone said that if you, you, know, you try and hurt someone else, you're really digging two graves, one for them and one for yourself. So you've got to forgive them even if they don't want to be reconciled. And then there's some people that maybe mistreat you. They take advantage of you. You can forgive them. But you don't ever have to do business with them again. You don't ever have to associate with them again. You just want to, you know, let them go, forgive them. Don't hold any hostility or malice in your heart so that you can have peace. But you may not have an ongoing relationship with them. Okay. Next, call, uh, next question that we have is from Rose. And she's asking, is it true that public sins need to be publicly confessed and private sins need to be privately uh, confessed, I should say? Yes. Um, now, an example of that would be, you know, n most sins are private between you and God. Um, uh, nothing in the Bible tells us that, you know, you're supposed to be confessing your sins to a priest. Uh, I heard a story about a young priest that was, uh, he's just being trained on how to hear confessions. And after his first day of hearing confessions, the old experienced priest took him for a little walk to debrief. And he said, now, 
if you hear someone and they divulge some extremely bad behavior, you know, you want to tell them that they need to repent of that and do all they can to avoid that. And he said, do your best not to say wow. So a young priest, he kept going, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you should be confessing your sins to God and not to man. But there are some things that are public and public may mean there's two or three people. Like when Peter denied Jesus three times, Jesus asked him in front of the apostles, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter basically made a public confession. And, um, you know, there are other examples in the Bible where people have had to make uh, some public confession because they sin publicly. I, I believe David not only told uh, Nathan I've sinned, but I think that he probably also had to admit something to mm -hmm. the people. And so, uh, and you need to sometimes pray for wisdom what that will mean, how, do you, how uh, what the line is and how you distinguish between the two. We have a question that's coming right online uh, as the program's begun. Joel is asking, will God intervene if I pray for him or pray to him for my teen's life? Well, I, you know, I, I absolutely believe that God wants us to mediate and intervene for our loved ones and to be praying for them. You have the example in the Bible of uh, Moses intervening for um, the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. You've got Abraham intervening for his nephew Lot and God answered his prayer. Um, I'm sure Noah spent a lot of time praying for his family. Now, the, you know, you always have to be aware that uh, individuals do have freedom of choice. God is not willing that any should perish. And yet some people, in spite of Jesus' sacrifice for them, they're going to just make up their mind to do their own thing and they will not turn. But continuing to pray like the father for the prodigal, many of those prodigals come home. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep praying. Absolutely. Be an encouragement and a blessing. The next call he's asking here, um, is a person born in sin? And if so, how do we overcome it? Well, uh, when you say born in sin, uh, everyone is born with this inherited defect in our DNA, for lack of another term, where originally man was designed by God to be motivated by love, but then because of sin, our compass got broken and now we point to self. We're motivated by selfishness. And so people are born with a sinful, selfish nature. And so the new birth is when God gives you the spirit and you start developing the mind of Christ. And it's a gift where the things you once hated and you now love, the things you once loved, you now hate. And it's really a change, a transformation of heart. That's the new birth. And so... You want to add to that? Or? Yeah, absolutely. And I, th I think, Pastor, like this is an, uh, we know it's an on, it's a day by day experience. It's not a one time thing. Sometimes people might get discouraged if they pray and they say, Lord, please, you know, change the way I feel about this thing. And then the next day they feel like, well, God didn't answer my prayer because I still somehow feel the same way. We shouldn't live our lives by feelings, mm -hmm. but uh, we need to continually humble ourselves. We need to surrender ourselves to God and ask the Spirit to do a work in us that we can't do for ourselves. And we, and we grow. Don't mm -hmm. become discouraged. I, in the Christian life, in reality, it sometimes is two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes two steps back, three steps forward. <laughs> but you want to be progressing. The Bible says grow on. And so don't get discouraged if you fall. Yeah, we have a person who sent in a question. Scotty's asking, <laughs> that's a good question, how do I get a greater desire for God and sorrow for sin? Well, we've sort of touched on that uh, right here in that um, the more you spend your time looking at Jesus, uh, the more you'll love Jesus, the more you see what he paid for your sin, the more sin will grieve you. And uh, the, the holiness of God is like oil and water. It does not go with sin. They don't mix. You know, m my father told me he'd never wanted to catch me smoking. And uh, I knew he felt very strongly about that because he was addicted to smoking. Well, I started smoking at 13. But for some reason, I was never tempted to smoke around my father. <laughs> uh, just something about his presence took away the desire. And so if we're walking with the Lord, it makes it easier for us to try to maintain a holy life. It's when we get away from the Lord. The Bible says you run from the devil, you draw near to God. And that's both of those are in the book of James. We have a question that's coming from uh, Marcy. And the question is, if you claim to be a Christian, but you lie to someone, should you tell them that you lied? Wouldn't that make God look bad? 
Well, of course, whenever a Christian does something that is disobedient, it, it's not a great witness. You might be thinking, isn't it better that I don't say anything now because then they'll think less of me at, as a Christian. Well, if you told someone, they asked you your age and you told them you were 39 and you're 42 and you still know that person, you should probably say, you know, I got to fess up. I need to tell you something. I wasn't being honest. And maybe you're afraid or you're embarrassed, but you can tell them. But you don't want to walk away knowing you've deliberately lied to a person. If you can right that wrong, tell the truth. And uh, I think the Lord will bless you for it. They'll think more of you because you have a conscience. And you said, you know, it's bothering me that I was dishonest with you. That actually is a, a witness when you do that. Another question that we have, Nicholas is asking, how do I get freedom from guilt after you realize and confess your sins to God? Well, believe what God promises. Remember the promise there in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, in keeping with that confession, it says if we confess and forsake our sins, we will have mercy. So we don't confess like the mafia that goes and they, they make a donation and they go through saying a prayer six times and they go out and shoot other people. There's no remorse for sin. Real repentance means a remorse, a willingness to turn away. And so if you've confessed your sin and you've turned away from your sin and you've turned to God, then you may still remember what you've done, but Jesus says, I've forgiven you. So do not put your, your faith in what you're feeling. Put your faith in, um, in, in the promises of God and his word. We have a question that's coming uh, online right now. It says... Um, Miriam is asking, if heaven is a perfect place and yet Lucifer, an angel of God, found it in his heart to hurt God, how was this possible? How did Lucifer rebel in the perfect heaven? Well, Lucifer is probably some of the strongest evidence that God made all of his creatures free. Um, God does not force anyone to love him. If we're forced to love him, then it's not really love. Lucifer chose to love himself more. He was so powerful and wise and beautiful he began to resent that the glory was going to Jesus and God and he wanted it for himself. God made all of his creatures perfect and I think it's in Ezekiel 28 it says you were perfect in the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. Sin is a mystery. If you could explain it, it wouldn't be sin. Uh, if Lucifer said it's not my fault because I had this, uh, I was pre-programmed by God to sin. God made him perfectly free God knew what would happen, but it was Lucifer's choice to be selfish and sinful. And of course, we all have that same choice where we make decisions every day. Mm -hmm. We can make decisions in favor of what we know is right. Uh, we can make decisions that vindicate, if you like, the character of God, mm -hmm. or we can make decisions that go against what God's will is for our life. So Amen. it's part of this revival series, praying that we might make wise choices and grow closer to God. Amen. Our last question that we have, uh, this is a question that comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Sashi is asking, what does it mean to be absent from the body and present with the Lord? All right, well, we'll answer that quickly. I, it means what it says. Uh, Paul is talking about um, when you're not living for the flesh, but you're living for the spirit. And he's also talking about death there. If a believer dies, their next conscious mm -hmm. thought is the presence of the Lord. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ rise first. So if when a person dies, a thousand years go by, their next conscious thought is the resurrection. There's no sense of time for them. Paul was saying, you know, I'm in a struggle between the two. I'd like to stay with you and encourage you. And I also, I don't mind being martyred and being with the Lord because the next thing he would know is the resurrection. But it hasn't happened yet. That's why it says in Acts chapter 2, Peter says, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us unto this day. And later, Peter says, David is not ascended into heaven. Well, as far as David knows, who died about a thousand years before Christ, he went to sleep, probably died of congestive heart failure. His next conscious thought is the presence of the Lord, the resurrection and a glorified body. So it means what it says, but it hasn't happened yet. 
Okay. Again, we want to thank you for all of the questions that have come in and keep sending them in. If you've been blessed by these presentations, we'd like to hear from you. Mm -hmm. We do have a theme song and it, uh, we encourage you to participate by singing along with us. Tonight we'll be uh, singing together, It's a Sweet, Sweet Spirit in This Place. You'll see the words on the bottom part of your screen and wherever you are, just join us as we prepare our hearts for the presentation. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. leading us in that that's a beautiful song I, I remember first time I heard that song I was traveling with a friend uh, I went to Texas and I was sort of a, a lay evangelist back then preaching in a Baptist church and uh, my friend and I were working together and he and his wife sang that song and uh, it was such a beautiful song it really touched my heart and that's what we're after friends we're seeking the Spirit of God during this revival so that we might draw closer to him and know what it means to, to have that new heart, to experience a genuine conversion. Now, each of the subjects that we're exploring during this series has something to do with the elements of revival. And again, I want to reiterate, you know, Amazing Facts cannot put revival on the calendar and say we've scheduled a revival. A revival is something that God does with his moving. But the catalyst for revival, historically, is going to be God's people praying, humbling themselves, seeking his face, and reading his word. And that's going to be the central theme of what we're going to talk about tonight in our subject, dealing with they found the book. And before I go to our passage that's going to be the springboard, let me just pray with you one more time. Father in heaven, we do pray that you might be exalted as we open this holy book and bring the word to life, Lord. I pray that you will forgive the sins of the instrument through which you will speak and that ultimately we hear your voice and that the Holy Spirit can uh, shine through your word and hearts can be transformed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible that talks about uh, the time of King Josiah. He was the greatest of the Hebrew kings, king of Judah, actually. And he comes into his experience on the heels of the very worst possible circumstances. Uh, Josiah is born to King Manasseh. King Manasseh was one of the most wicked kings of Judah. Well, no, he was the most wicked king of Judah. Probably the most wicked king of Israel was Ahab. But uh, Manasseh even went so far to offer his children as sacrifice to devils. And so here, Josiah is born into this kingdom that is spiritually dilapidated. But he has a heart for God. And you can first read about it. And the principal places we're going to be looking in our study today as we talk about the Word of God is going to be 2 Chronicles 34 and also 2 Kings 22. They're really parallel passages, but one sometimes, one chapter emphasizes uh, little different points than the other. And you read in, I'm in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, and it tells us that Josiah began to reign when he was eight years old. So he becomes king when he's very young. Then in the eighth year of his reign, in verse 3, 
while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. Now, he's not seeking the gods of Manasseh or the gods of some of the other bad kings. He is returning to, the, you know, he knows he's a descendant of David. And David, even then, was uh, famous for his devotion to God. And that became his hero. But they really lost track of the Bible. Most of what Josiah is learning about God is being passed on to him orally. But he's got a heart for God. He, he has a yearning to be different, to be holy. And you know, the Bible promises, if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. So when he's uh, eight years old, he's seeking God. In the 12th year of his reign, when he's about 20, he begins to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places of the wooden images and the carved images and the molded images. And he's breaking down the pagan altars. Now he realized maybe when he was a little too young, he hadn't established power enough to go against some of the, the pagan leaders that were in the kingdom. But now he's becoming more confident and he's, he's taking s risky steps. He's changing the religion where they'd been worshiping these idols. And as he continues to seek God, it says in the 18th year of his reign, in verse 8, well now that means he's about 26, when he had purged the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, Messiah, and the governor of the city, and Joah, and he, he sets them on a mission to purge, to clean the temple, to rebuild the temple. It had been neglected. Now this is the temple that was the Temple of Solomon. It had once been a glorious building, but um, it was dilapidated. So they collect money, and he's restoring the temple, and you go to verse 14, and this is where it gets really interesting. Now they brought out the money that was brought into the house by Hilkiah the priest, and he found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Now what book is that talking about? You can read in Deuteronomy chapter 31. It's probably the book of Deuteronomy, which was the summary of the law. And in Deuteronomy, last sermon of Moses basically, he says in verse uh, 24 of chapter 31, So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of the law in a book, when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it might be there as a witness against you. Well, over the years when Manasseh was in power and some of the other wicked kings, maybe one of the faithful priests in order to protect the word of God had hidden it. Something like years later, some of the devout Essenes that lived around the Dead Sea, they took large passages of the scriptures and they didn't want the Romans to destroy their religion and so they hid them in caves that were discovered 2,000 years later in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So some of the priests evidently had hidden this scroll that very well may have been the original. It'd be like for you and I, you know, uh, getting a hold of the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. This was the actual document that has been written by the hand of Moses, but they lost their own scriptures. Maybe Manasseh, you know, he killed Isaiah the prophet. Maybe he had purged the land from some of the other scriptures that were out there. But evidently, they, had, they thought this is a wonderful thing. They've discovered the book of the Lord, the Bible, and of all things they discovered in the house of the Lord. And he said, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Now that to me, that's a whole sermon right there. Just think about that. What a shocker to find the book of the Lord in the house of the Lord. You know, you can find a lot of things in places that are called churches today and not find the Bible. And I've been to many churches where they supply Bibles for the congregation, but they only supply the New Testament. And uh, you can go to a lot of churches where the pastor will stand up and he may preach for an hour and never open his Bible. It's just uh, phenomenal that you can have a country where a lot of people call themselves Christians and the average citizen is basically biblically illiterate. You'd be amazed how many Christians there are out there today that think the epistles are the wives of the apostles and that Noah married Joan of Arc. There's just a lot of biblical ignorance out there. And here, these are God's people. They're the people of the book. But somehow they had lost track of the book. I wonder if the Lord has a message for you and me in this story that it's possible for us to have a temple, to have a church, to go through all of the, the rituals of a religion and somehow lose track of the most important document upon which everything is based. Now the Bible is the foundation for the Christian faith. 
all we know about Jesus and all we know about salvation and all we know about heaven and hell, it all springs from this book. And neglecting that book is always going to lead towards the lapidation of a Christian's faith. Not only is that true in congregations, it's true in individual hearts. The Bible isn't just a book to be read in church once a week. It's something that we should be reading every day. Every Christian. Jesus said that it's the bread of life. And we'll get to that and more about that later. So they find this book and they come and they report to the king about the progress of the renovation in the temple. And it's in the process of talking to young king Josiah. It says, Then Shaphan the scribe told him, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. <laughs> a book. It was the book. And Shaphan read it before the king. So he reads the entire book of Deuteronomy. And it happens, verse 19, that when the king heard these words of the law, he tore his clothes. Now, you know, part of the reason for that is in Deuteronomy, especially if you get to chapter 28, it's got the blessings and the cursings. And it says that if you forsake me, if you forget the words of this book, if you turn away and worship other gods, then you're going to be oppressed by your enemies and you're going to have all of these problems and everything Moses had foretold would happen had happened to them at that point. Matter of fact, the only thing left was, he said, you'll be carried away by foreign nations. And I think that had already happened to uh, the northern kingdom at this point. It had, that's right. So it's getting ready to happen to the southern kingdom. When the king hears this, he's overcome with grief. He thought, how come we didn't listen to the Lord? Look at what's happened to us. There was a great uh, death spiritually in the kingdom. But the king sparked one of the greatest revivals that you read about in the Bible. And you see, everything began to turn when he started seeking after God and they found the book of the Lord. Not only did they find the book, it, you'll notice here, they read the book. So I'm going to go through seven points. Let me tell you what they are real quick. I've been having fun during this series trying to develop uh, alliterations with some of the titles. Notice the Bible must be read. Reading the Bible leads to repentance. Reading it leads to requests, prayer. Reading the Bible should be done publicly. The Bible causes reformation. The Bible causes restoration. And reading the Bible leads to revival. So this, these are the points I want to highlight from this story, just so you know where I'm going. They say that the most important part of a good sermon is tell people what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you said. So I'm letting you know ahead of time where we're going. So when the king hears this, he humbles himself. He repents. He tears his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahikam and the son of Shaphan and, and Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan the scribe and Isaiah, go of the servant of the king, saying, go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel. So you notice the first thing I want to say is the Bible must be read, and that's going to lead to other reforms. Second Chronicles, it tells us that he read the Bible. Go to 1 Timothy 4.13. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. You know, there's something that happens powerfully when we study the Bible, and someone's going to maybe send in a question, and I'll anticipate that. Friends, if you've never done it before, I would really encourage you to go through the Amazing Facts Bible Study Course. It's free online. You can also see on, uh, at the website if you want to go through it manually, the paper copies. We still have those as well, but it'll change your life. Study the Word and um, get into a group Bible study. Take a topic, take a doctrine and study it. This is what we do in evangelistic meetings. We go night by night for somewhere between 22 and 30 nights talk about the main fundamental teachings of the Bible. And, you know, it transforms people's lives. I've seen marriages restored. I've seen uh, people's depression relieved and all kinds of wonderful miracles in the simple study of the Word. Jesus said, Matthew 12, verse 5, Have you not read in the law on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath, but they're blameless? You know, I want to emphasize that Jesus said to the religious leaders, Have you not read? Have you not read? Over and over. He says, have you not read? Or it is written. It is written. What does it tell us about Jesus? He kept referring them back to the priority of the Bible to understand these things. Matthew 19, verse 4. And he answered them and said, Have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female? 
So not only does Jesus want us to read the Bible, he had them go all the way back to the beginning. He's quoting Genesis, Moses. Someone once said that uh, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to a person who is not falling apart. You've probably seen some of those people. I, I know some saints. I've had to change Bibles over the years because they get damaged in travel and, and I go to so many countries. But uh, I, I've seen some of the old saints. Their Bibles are just, all the pages are dirty with notes and the corners are all worn completely off. I've got a friend, he read Revelation so much that the first uh, half inch of Revelation's corner was gone from turning to it. And a Bible that is worn out usually belongs to a person who is not falling apart. And so uh, you want to read your Bibles. It's very simple. This led to a revival in the kingdom, as you will see. The other thing is it was in the reading of the book it led to repentance. So as they're reading this, the king, he tears his clothes. And then, you know what the prophetess says? She sends a message back to King Josiah. She said, but as for the king of Judah, who has sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner, you should speak to him and say, thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words, don't harden your heart, humble yourself, against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes, and you wept before me. I have also heard you, says the Lord. Surely I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. God said, I'm not going to bring the judgment on the kingdom in your days. I'm going to give you peace. I'm prolonging your tranquility, your reign, your mercy, because you repented and you humbled yourself. You know, again, I could take a detour right now and talk about the power of humility. Uh, through the Bible, even when Josiah's father, wicked King Manasseh, when he humbled himself, even though he'd, he'd served the devil for nearly 50 years, God forgave him and restored to him the kingdom when he humbled himself. Wicked King Ahab, who killed an innocent man so he could steal his vineyard, when he heard the judgment from God, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth, he humbled himself, he went softly, and God said to Elijah the prophet, Behold how Ahab humbles himself. Because he's humbling himself, I will not bring this calamity upon him in his day. God showed him mercy because he humbled himself. When Nebuchadnezzar had the dream of the tree that was going to be cut down, and Daniel said, You are the tree. Then Daniel gave him advice. Humble yourself. Break off your sins by doing righteousness. It may be a lengthening of your tranquility. Friends, one of the most important things we can do as individuals and as a country is humble ourselves before God and to seek His face and turn from our wicked ways. And then He will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sin and heal our land and our world. It's a great time for revival. Uh, and I'm hoping that, you know, it's, it's not even too late right now in this sermon. We're trying to get as many people involved as possible. You could just text a friend right now and say, are you watching the Amazing Facts New Heart Revival? Encourage your friends to tune in. And uh, we'd like to start a different kind of pandemic of the Holy Spirit uh, if we would uh, spread these truths virally, as they say. So reading the Word led to repentance. And then as a result of that, you also read in 2 Chronicles, then they were inquiring of the Lord. You can read in 2 Chronicles 34, 21, Reading the word then led to inquiring of God. There was an increase in prayer. You know, you'll find that the Bible tells you to pray, and reading the Bible makes you want to pray. Uh, the best prayers, and most of what we learn about prayer, is in the Bible. And so, reading the Bible and praying go hand in hand. Now, in this series, we're going to be highlighting the, the basics of the Christian faith. And those things are very simply, pray, Read the Bible, share your faith. If someone is backsliding, I can almost guarantee they're neglecting their prayer life or they're neglecting their Bible reading and they're probably not doing anything for the Lord, meaning they're not doing anything using their gifts to share their faith in some way. Is If you are going through the Jewish sanctuary on your way to the Holy of Holies, before you can get to the Holy of Holies, you had to go through the holy place. And in the holy place, there were three articles of furniture. There is the bread, there's a candlestick, there's an altar of incense. Those represent the three essential disciplines, the keys to revival in the Christian life. The bread, 
is the word of God. The altar of incense represents prayer. You can read that in Revelation. And the light, Jesus said, you're to let your light shine. We're to let our light shine and be witnesses for him. Those are the three primary disciplines for the Christian. You want to experience a personal revival, then you just spend time, make a schedule and say, Lord, every day I'm going to spend this much time reading the Bible. You might say, Pastor Doug, I don't always understand it. Do it anyway. You know, sometimes you can eat food that has no flavor, but it'll keep you alive even if it has no taste. And you may not realize it, but it is keeping you alive. There's vitamins you can't taste in there. And so it's like a baby when they're first listening to their parents. They might be wondering, what is this noise these humans are making? But they keep listening, and somewhere along the way, they piece things together. It's amazing how their minds work. They begin to recognize words, and soon they can say them, and they learn speech. Well, when they're first listening to their parents, and the way some parents talk to babies, it's amazing they ever learn to talk. But when they're listening to their parents, they then learn the language. And, <laughs> you know, for me, Chinese is a very difficult language. Uh, it, it's, it, it goes the wrong direction, and there's so many different characters, I don't think I could ever learn their alphabet. It's amazing to me, when I go to China, I even see two-year-olds speaking Chinese. I think, Karen, look at that. Even the children speak Chinese over here. It's absolutely amazing. It's because they hear their parents saying it, they learn it. Keep reading. You will understand more. First time I started reading the Bible, I grew up in New York City. I, you know, we barely speak English where I grew up. And uh, we didn't speak King James English. And I'll admit, I struggled sometimes. But I got enough of it where pretty soon through context, I started understanding it. And I'm so glad that I was reading the King James Bible because it taught me a lot about the English language I still needed to learn. One of the greatest documents in the world. So as they're reading the Bible, they're praying, and they send this request to the, the uh, prophetess, Hulda. And then after uh, she sends her message back to them, they decide, you know, this message is too good to keep to ourselves. We need to share it. So now they're reading the Bible publicly. Not only should you be reading your Bible at home in family worship, if you're by yourself, your personal quiet time with God, your personal devotions, if you have a family, you should have some form of worship. If the kids are little, you make it simple. You don't make it too long. As they grow and their minds expand, you expand a little bit. You get a little deeper. But you need to be reading the word with your family. And then what happens publicly? We also read the word in church. And it leads to a reformation. Second Chronicles 34, verse 30. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Jerusalem and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Everybody the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small. Everybody needs salvation, whosoever, great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. You think Pastor Doug preaches long. King Josiah read the whole book of Deuteronomy, which you can do. It's, what, 33 chapters? I forget. But you can do it all in one day. And so they're reading the whole book of Deuteronomy to the people there in this um, assembly. Nehemiah 8.8 8, and says that they gathered all of Israel together and so they read distinctly from the book of the law of God and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And you know what? This was transformational. When the king read the book to the people, it also happened during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, then they asked the people to do something about what they read. They said, okay, this is what God's word says. The king said, I'm going to make a covenant. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And the king says, I want my kingdom to serve the Lord. And all the people took a stand with the king. Now, they had not done any reformation yet. They first made a decision. We want to be God's people again. After they made that decision, then they began to do things tangible. So many people get it backwards and they never get off square one. They say, I don't know if I can be a Christian because I got to change this and I got to change that and all these things. And don't think that way. That's what the devil wants to discourage you. Make up your mind. It's the right thing to do and say, Lord, I am going to serve you. And there's power in that. And once you say, Lord, I'm choosing to serve you, you have surrendered your will to God. He then can combine his power with your free choice to enable you to do what he's asking you to do. So the people took a stand with the Lord and this led to a reformation. 
And you can read about this in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 24 and 25. Moreover, Josiah, he put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists and the household gods and the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law that were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Finding the book led to repentance. It led to prayer and intercession and request to God. It led to their um, it being read publicly, and now it leads to practical reformation. And the friends, <laughs> it's like um, Marco Polo said, I haven't told you the half yet. If you go to um, 2 Kings chapter 22 and you start to read about what the king does, I don't have time to read all this to you, but you can read 2 Kings, go to chapter 23 actually, and uh, it tells us that the king, well, let's see, I'll start here. Um, verse 4, And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and the priests of the second order and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal and for Ashereth and for the hosts of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron. And he carried their ashes to Bethel. Bethel is where they had that golden calf. He was getting ready to burn things there. Then he removed the idolatrous priests who the kings of Judah had ordained, his ancestors that worshipped these other gods, to burn uh, incense to images. Well, you know, God says in his law, do not make images and pray to them. He says, we're going to obey that. And it says that he went through Judah and all around Jerusalem. And those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, the moon, and the constellations, and all the hosts, that's astrology. And he brought out the wooden images out of the house of the Lord. Oh, boy, it just breaks your heart. How did wooden images get into the house of the Lord? And he burned it by the brook Kidron. And he ground it to ashes so they wouldn't ever be tempted to say, let's go fetch them back out of the valley. So they would never go back. He tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons, that's called the Sodomites, that were in the house of the Lord. And where the women wove hangings for the wooden image. Uh, that's something that's not even appropriate to talk about uh, in uh, mixed settings. And he brought out the priests from the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Gibeah to Beersheba. He broke down the high places and the gates. All these false, idolist worship places they had throughout the kingdom. I can go on and on. Uh, they, they were worshiping Milcom and Amnon and Shemoth and uh, all these corruptions. And some of it had been there ever since the days of Solomon. No king ever brought about a more thorough revival than King Josiah. Uh, he, it says that he loved the Lord with all of his heart. And so he, he brought a reformation. Now, as you read the Bible, there's things, if you want a revival, and that's why we're doing this, to have a new heart, you draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Well, we draw near to him by studying his word. We draw near to him by praying. We draw near to him by repenting of our sins. And then I'll tell you a real practical way to draw near to God. If you've got reading literature in your home that you know dishonors God, make your garbage can an altar and throw it away. Uh, if you've got programs that you're watching that you know that the Lord can't approve of, you've got to stop. If, if you're wasting your time doing things that you know does not honor God, turn away from those things. If there's words in your vo vocabulary that you know you wouldn't want another Christian to hear, stop speaking those words. And I can make a long list at this point. If you're, you know, drinking alcohol, if you're smoking cigarettes and using drugs and, and all of these things that are really classified as worldliness, then say, make up your mind and say, Lord, confess. Say, this is a sin and I need your help. But by your grace, I'm going to take a stand and I'm going to follow you. As soon as you make that decision, a power is released in your life and God is going to help you Make all kinds of changes. You know, sometimes people say, oh, you know, Doug, we can't really change. You'll never convince me that because you didn't know the old Doug Batchelor. And there's still plenty of work to do on the new Doug Batchelor. But I see how much God has changed my life. And I have no patience for people who tell me they can't change. You can do all things through Christ. He can make fantastic changes. And this is what Reformation does. Josiah not only said, I'm going to pray. And he not only repented. He then took a decisive action and he made tangible changes. 
not only was there a reformation, because of this, there was a restoration. He continued reading the book. He says, you know, I seem to remember that while I was reading in the book of the law, I read about the Passover. We have not been keeping that sacred time. And so you read here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 21. Then the king commanded all his people, saying, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of the covenant. Such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel or the kings of Judah. You know, I read in Isaiah that one of the ways a revival is going to be manifested in the last days. It says God's people are going to be called the restorer of paths to dwell in, the repairers of the breach. Now, for much of the Christian world, they started following the patterns of Babylon. And when it comes to something as basic as one of the Ten Commandments, it says, uh, don't worship idols. They started worshiping idols. Another commandment says, remember the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. They stopped keeping any day, and they're not keeping the seventh day, which is Saturday. And you're going to see before Jesus comes back a movement where people are going to get rid of their idolatry. They're going to get rid of their adultery. They're going to get rid of their Sabbath breaking. And they're going to start returning to the Lord. There's going to be a restoration of biblical truth. You know, as they read the Bible, things began to change. It was Dwight L. Moody who said, the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. Some people don't read the Bible because they say, I feel convicted when I read it. So I'm just not going to read it. It's like a, a man who, uh, he was in uh, China and he ordered a microscope from Germany and it was a, a high-powered microscope and they didn't have any lens that were so accurate then and, and he couldn't wait to open it up. And the first thing he did is he took out, he said, I want to look at something small in this microscope. He got a piece of rice that was there not far from his dinner plate and he put it on the little glass slide and he looked through the microscope, and as he zoomed in, he saw that there were bugs on his rice. Well, rice was his favorite food. So he put the microscope back in the box and shipped it home because he thought, I can't get rid of my rice. I'm going to have to get rid of my microscope. Well, the microscope was not causing the problem. <laughs> it, it was just revealing what the problem was. Some people are afraid to read the Bible because they'll be convicted. What you've got to do is boil your rice. All right. So, the Bible brings about a restoration. And then point number seven here, reading the Bible leads to revival. You can see it, it tells us in 2 Kings 23, verse 25, that as a result of this, the people returned to the Lord. They had years of peace because of this. It says, Now therefore, there was no king like Josiah, who turned to the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any king arise like him after him. You know what that's saying? There was no king, even King David, was not as devoted as King Josiah. Not Solomon, not any king. Of course, the only one that can compare to him is, is Jesus. You know, Jesus is something like Josiah. Josiah went in and he purged the house of God. You read in the Bible where Jesus went into the temple and he made a lash and he drove out everything that was defiling the house of God. And he says, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. And that's what Jesus wants to do in our lives. You see, you and I, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when we repent, when we read the word and we repent of our sins, we invite Jesus into our hearts. We pray and we request. And he comes in. He then begins a reformation. And he starts to drive out the unclean things in our lives. The Holy Spirit will begin to convict us. And you realize there's a, a fresh wind blowing, blowing through your heart. It's like spring cleaning. And you begin to experience that new heart. And you'll go through struggles. And if you're a baby Christian and you say, well, you know, Pastor Doug, I pray and then I feel bad about my sins. You know, as you continue to walk closer to the light of God during a revival, every step you take, the light gets brighter. You are going to become more aware of spots on your clothing. Well, then you wash them. You walk a little closer to the light. You're going to start seeing the lint on your clothes and you walk a little closer. Don't be discouraged if the light is revealing things. You're going the right direction. The other alternative is you just turn back into the dark 
and you die with the lost. Friends, walk in the light, Jesus said, while you've got the light. The day is coming when the day is going to be far spent and uh, the night is going to come when no man can work. So you want to keep moving towards the light. So, you know, I wanted to just bring a few things to you about the Bible in our closing minutes here. First of all, someone once said the Bible is a, an acronym for basic instructions before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. George Mueller said, the vigor of our spiritual life will be in exact proportion to the place that the Bible is held in our thoughts and our life. And so whatever experience we have in our lives, it's going to be, as a Christian, it'll be in proportion to the value place on the Bible. The Bible tells us that the Bible is like a light. So look at some of these points here. And notice everything I mentioned is also telling us about Jesus. The Bible is like a light. Jesus is like a light. Psalm 119, verse 105, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know, I'm always amazed. You can ask Karen, I've, I've just been reading all these books on uh, history and great explorers. They're all true books, but I, I love to read about the great explorers. read a book about Captain uh, James Cook, just an incredible navigator. Back then they had no GPS. He went all around the world several times sailing to the Pacific and he knew how to found the, find these little specks of islands out in the middle of nowhere in this blue galaxy because he could study the stars. He could tell from the stars. He could tell from the sun, from the moon, what his exact position was. He allowed the lights to guide him. If it was cloudy, they had a really hard time figuring out where they were. They would wait. And even if the clouds parted and Cook could see a few stars, he could quickly calibrate where on the globe he was from those lights. The Bible also tells us where we are in history right now. Jesus said you can tell the weather by the looking at the sky. We should be able to tell the signs of the times that we're living in now by looking at God's word. It's a light. Proverbs 6.23, the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. Don't turn away from God's law. It's a light. Isaiah 8.20, to the law in the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, there is no light in them. And so we want to measure everything by the light of God's word. If you want to know if something's true, shine the spotlight of God's word on any doctrine or subject and you'll know pretty quick. The Bible is like bread. Not only is the Bible compared to bread, Jesus is compared to bread. Jesus said, It is written, Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Job said, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And Jeremiah 15, 16, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Now, hey, people usually don't forget to eat food because they begin to notice that they become weak physically. They get low blood sugar. I can promise you, if you start neglecting your Bible reading, you will get spiritual low blood sugar. You cannot be healthy if you're neglecting the bread of life. We need to eat it on a regular basis. You notice Jesus did not compare the Bible to, he didn't say, I, I am the cupcake of life. You know, Jesus didn't say, that I am the pizza of life. He said, I am the bread of life. It, is a, it was a basic, you know, at every meal around the world, in Mexico, they got tortillas and they, they got bread in, uh, in Italy and France and Europe. They eat a lot of bread there and it, it doesn't matter. You go to India, it's japatis. But bread is like the basic you find at even the table of the poorest. Jesus said, it's, I'm the basic food that everybody needs. So he's the bread of life. Now, before I leave this, I, I, I should mention that there's different kinds of spiritual food. You know, Peter talks about as Newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Babies eat milk. And that's got everything they need. But as they grow, they need more. Notice, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual, but, but as carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for up until now you are not able to handle it. Neither are you able now. So, what Paul says, and he says it a couple of times. Well, let me read Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, then I'll elaborate. For though by this time you ought to be teachers of the word, 
Some of you need someone to teach you again what are the first principles in the oracles of God. The Bible is called the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of only milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He's a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So many people are not using the Bible. They don't know how to share it. You know, the reason I remember Scripture is because I got involved in sharing it with other people. Helps me remember it. But a lot of people that claim to be Christians are spiritual babies. Now, babies are cute. And it's fun to watch babies when they first feed themselves and they got their little sweet potatoes and they try to get the spoon in their mouth and it goes in the ears and the nose. And we grab our cameras and everyone laughs and takes pictures and we send it to everybody. Look, isn't it cute? Baby got food all over the place. But we don't take pictures if they're 25 years old and they're doing that. Uh, then it's just plain old pathetic. And that's how it is for God and the angels when people say, yeah, I accepted the Lord 20 years ago and I still don't know any scripture. We ought to be memorizing the scriptures now. If someone took away your Bible, do you remember enough of the Bible? Have you stored enough of the word of God in your heart so that you can resist temptation? Every time Jesus was tempted, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And he fought the devil that way, which is probably a, a good place to mention the Bible is also um, like a rock. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. How did David kill Goliath? With a rock. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man that builds his house on a rock. And this is a rock of immense proportions. Jesus is the rock of ages. And uh, we need to be building on the foundation of his word. Luke says we dig deep in his word. In Daniel chapter 2, it's a rock that destroys that pagan uh, image the king dreams about. The Ten Commandments are written on stone. So um, not only is the Bible like a rock, it's unchanging. You can, you can establish your life, a church, a nation on the word of God. But it's also true that Jesus is the rock. The Bible says that uh, the Bible is like a sword. It's a weapon to attack the enemy. You can read in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The Bible is a sword that we use for fighting the enemy. But Jesus, his word is compared to a sword. Matthew 10, 34, Christ said, Do not think that I came to send peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And in Psalm 119, verse 11, he says, Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin. God gives us his word to save us from the enemy. Jesus fought every temptation. It is written, it is written, it is written. It is not only a weapon for offense, it is a weapon for defense to resist the devil when he comes. You know, I remember reading a fascinating story from history about um, Sam Houston Jr., the son of the famous Texan. And during the Civil War in the Battle of Shiloh, uh, he was struck by a bullet. He had these big like 50 caliber rounds that hit him in the back, knocked him down. He thought he might be dead, but he realized he felt okay, and he got up, kept running. Hid behind a tree, and he later pulled out his backpack, and his little family Bible that had been given to him, his parents issued him a little Bible, he found that the bullet had lodged in the Bible. And there you see on the screen an actual picture that's at the Shiloh Museum of Sam Houston's Bible. And... Uh, he flipped it over, the bullet went all the way through the New Testament and the bullet stopped on Psalm 70 which says, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. You know, we want God to help us. We want God to deliver us and the best deliverance comes. The quickest revival, reformation, restoration, it comes when we start spending time in his word. Jesus is the Word. The Word was made flesh to dwell among us. If you knew you had Jesus sitting in your house in His Word and you ignore Him, then what does it say about how much we love Him? It is a love letter from Christ to us and He wants to speak to each of us. Friends, we hope during this revival you'll make tangible decisions to spend more time in prayer, we'll talk about that one night, and in His Word. We hope that you plan on joining us again also as this series begins. Next program, Tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock, let me pray with you before we go off the air. Loving Lord, 
We pray that the importance and power of your book, the Bible, will come alive in our hearts. Help us to appreciate that it is a holy message from our Savior and that we'll live by every word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.